will be continuing to talk about flavor physics. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yeah, it's, so we're back to flavor physics. Um, we are a bit behind plan, but uh, uh, probably OK. I will skip a few things uh, uh, here and there going forward. Uh, but I want to spend a, a couple of minutes to, to wrap up the topics that uh, we have been discussing uh, uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday. Uh, so just a, a few uh, comments, or, or I will, and I will try to re-emphasize the, the role that uh, flavor physics is playing. And uh, there are two sides to that. Uh, the first, uh, uh, the first role that flavor physics plays is in the context of the of the standard model, and flavor physics in the standard model is all about the Yukawa couplings, as we discussed. Um, the Yukawa couplings are the only sources of flavor symmetry breaking in the in the standard model. So, if you're talking about flavor physics in the standard model, we're talking about the, the physics of the of the Yukawa couplings, um, how they break the flavor symmetry, and uh, also what the structure of the, of the Yukawa couplings is. Uh, we know that the Yukawa couplings have a very hierarchical structure. The, the masses of the quarks and leptons are very hierarchical. The, uh, the misalignment between the, the up and the down Yukawa, so the CKM matrix, is a very hierarchical structure. And uh, the, one of the big questions that one can ask uh, in the context of flavor physics in the standard model is, where do these hierarchies come from? So the, what is the origin? of the hierarchies in the Yukawa couplings. And, uh, uh, and this question motivates a uh, flavor model building. So, uh, uh, if one thinks that these hierarchies are not just there by chance, that uh, if these Yukawa couplings generically would be just some order one uh, couplings, uh, uh, we wouldn't expect these hierarchical spectrum that we observe. So if there is some physics that uh, uh, that imprints this structure on the Yukawas. What is that physics? What options does one have? Uh, do, they, do these uh, flavor models lead to any observable consequences? How can we, how can we test them? So that would be uh, sort of the, the big question of flavor in the context of the, of the standard model. And then the, the second side to that would be flavor beyond the standard model, uh, and there, uh, the question that one asks, are there any other sources of flavor violation beyond these uh, Yukawa couplings? study what are the best uh, flavor probes uh, to, uh, to address this question. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the first part is uh, um, flavor in the standard model in some sense is a, is a very theoretical question, trying to come up with models that, that generate hierarchies. The second part, flavor physics beyond the standard model, is more uh, experimentally driven in, in some sense. One uh, makes measurements of, of flavor transitions uh, and compares them to standard model predictions and tries to understand if there's anything uh, beyond the sources of flavor breaking uh, that exists in the standard model. And uh, in principle, that, that can go uh, uh, in a few ways. Uh, it could happen that one actually discovers discrepancies between standard model predictions and measurements in the context of, of flavor changing transitions. So, One finds anomalies uh, in the in the data. Oh, there's a question. Yeah. Oh, I was just wondering um, if there were evidence for flavor breaking above the electroweak scale, would that definitely be BSM? Um, okay. The question is, uh, what, what exactly you, you, you mean by that? So uh, the question is, uh, though, um, it could be that there is beyond standard model physics uh, above the electroweak scale, but it doesn't contain new sources of, of flavor breaking, that all flavor breaking is still governed by the, by the Yukawa couplings. That, that could happen. Um, 
and that might still show up in terms of, of flavor anomalies if you, if you want. Uh, or it could also be that uh, this new physics comes with new sources of flavor relation, uh, and then you might see uh, sort of more, uh, uh, more dramatic uh, uh, discrepancies between standard model predictions and, and, uh, and uh, experimental results and flavor transitions. Um, but yeah, so um, if one does observe such discrepancies between experiment and standard model predictions, if one has these anomalies, uh, that those anomalies they then can be interpreted as indirect evidence for for some uh, presence of, of new physics. And uh, then one can try to go after that new physics uh, directly, for example, at colliders. So one would have a, would have a target uh, to explore at, uh, at colliders. The other way that that could go is that uh, one might have a discovery of new physics uh, at a collider first, or some direct uh, discovery of, of new particles, um, maybe in experiments that look for axions or, or for dark photons, or um, some discovery of, of, a, of a new particle. And in, in that case, uh, one can use flavor measurements to, uh, to understand the, the properties of, of that new degrees of freedom, to which extent uh, can they couple to uh, fermions in a flavor violating way? Can uh, their couplings uh, be new sources of flavor violation? Uh, one has existing constraints uh, already, and in, in many cases, one will come to the conclusion that these new particles probably have to have uh, uh, couplings which are fairly aligned with the standard model sources of, of flavor breaking. And uh, there is an example, uh, a recent example, where this happened when the Higgs was discovered uh, 10 years ago. Uh, very soon after, there were many papers written that discussed to which extent can the Higgs actually have flavor changing couplings, and to which extent do we uh, know the, the flavor properties of the Higgs from already existing measurements of flavor transitions. And uh, uh, as it turns out, the, the Higgs uh, the flavor changing coupling of the Higgs have to be very small. Otherwise, we would have already seen indirect evidence of those uh, new sources of flavor violation in low energy flavor probes. So, yes. Oh. Uh, Oh, you, you're wondering why I wrote generically new physics and not new yeah. particle. Um, yeah, I, I guess, I don't know if you can come up with, with sort of very exotic types of, of new physics and particles <laughs> or, or something like that that, that wouldn't uh, 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 be described as, a, as actual uh, uh, particle state uh, in, in, in a Lagrangian. Uh, yeah, I, I, that was not a... Uh, uh, I didn't want to make the impression that that this is uh, that I'm looking for very exotic stuff here. So most of the time, yes, this will be some particles that I that I uh, would introduce to explain these anomalies. And these particles, I can then try to look for it at colliders or at other experiments that look for new particles directly. Not sure if I understood your question, but. Um, yeah, this would sort of see the two optimistic cases. Either one discovers new physics indirectly in, in flavor processes and then goes after that new physics uh, in a second step and directly, uh, or one discovers the new physics directly first and then tries to characterize uh, its properties, its couplings through flavor measurements. Of course, as a third option, one discovers uh, no new physics anywhere uh, in in that context, and while in that case, we can still do cosmology or something. <laughs> All right, um, so that's the sort of the big picture, the role that flavor is, is playing. Um, uh, the second half of the day, we will talk a 
a bit more about this origin of the hierarchies in the Yukawa couplings, which type of models are out there that try to address uh, hierarchies in, in the Yukawa couplings. And then uh, tomorrow we will uh, discuss some of these flavor anomalies that are, that are out there and to which extent they, they can be indirect evidence for new physics. Uh, so sort of a, a case study of, of how this uh, direction might, might play out. Uh, but before we go there, I want to spend a, a bit of time discussing um, how we actually know this uh, uh, standard model flavor sources. Uh, what do we know about the uh, masses and CKM mixing angles in the standard model? Where do these measurements uh, come from? Uh, uh, and how, do we, uh, how we, did we figure out that we have these hierarchical structures in the, in the Yukawa couplings? Actually, I will skip uh, some of those uh, things that you find in the notes in particular. Uh, I will skip uh, the discussion about the quark and the lepton masses, how they are measured, uh, which values they, they have. Um, you should know roughly what the masses of the, of the various quarks and, and leptons are. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, write quickly down though, what we will be discussing now in the chapter three of these notes will be the determination of the standard model flavor parameters. Yeah, and in terms of the quark and lepton masses, the only thing I, I want to remind you is that they span many orders of magnitude from the, from the heaviest, uh, the top quark, uh, to the lightest uh, charged fermion, the, the electron. There are almost uh, six orders of magnitude. And uh, uh, the question is, where does this uh, big discrepancy in, uh, in masses come from? Is there any physics reason be, behind this spread of, of masses over these many orders of magnitude? Um, but then let me come to the CKM matrix and discuss that, uh, the determination of the CKM matrix in a bit more detail. So let me just write it out uh, explicitly. Uh, the various elements of the CKM matrix, we have VUD, VUS, VUB, VCD, VCS, and VCB, and then VTD, VTS, and VTB. And the CKM matrix, uh, it's, a, it's a unitary matrix, but it's a, a special unitary matrix in the sense that it's a, uh, that not all faces that could be inside the CKM matrix are actually physical. Uh, we had discussed that only one physical face shows up in the CKM matrix. And there are various different ways to, to parameterize uh, the matrix in terms of three mixing angles and, and one face. And the so-called uh, standard uh, parameterization is the following. One writes the CKM matrix as a product of, of three uh, rotations, a rotation uh, between the second and the third generation, cosine of a mixing angle, sine of a mixing angle, minus sine of a mixing angle, cosine of the mixing angle. And then the next is a rotation between the first and the third generation, and there one tags on a face, e to the minus i delta. And then finally a rotation between the first and the second generation. Yes, yes, you have freedom where, where you want to put the face. You have freedom in, in which order you, you do those rotations. These are just different uh, conventions, how you uh, might write the CKM matrix. That's just the standard parameterization that, that people had uh, agreed on to, to use. In, in this particular uh, parameterization, this face uh, delta, when you multiply this out, uh, shows up in, in some of those uh, CKM matrix elements. So in the standard parameterization, VUD, VUS, VCB, and VTB, they uh, are real. 
and the face only shows up in the, in the other five entries. If we were to put the face in some other place, then other CKM matrix elements would be complex, others might be real. Now, experimentally, uh, we know that those mixing angles are small. Um, in particular, uh, we know that this uh, mixing between the first and the second generation um, is quite a bit smaller than, than one. Uh, we know that the mixing between the second and third generation is quite a bit smaller than the mixing between the first and second generation. And we know that the mixing between the first and the third generation is quite a bit smaller than the mixing between the second and the third generation. And uh, that motivates a, a reparametrization, uh, the so-called Wolfenstein parametrization uh, that I want to introduce. So one can make this hierarchy manifest in the so-called Wolfenstein parametrization, which is a, an exact reparametrization of the, uh, uh, of the CKM matrix. Uh, so instead of S12, uh, well, you want just uh, relabels S12 as lambda, the Wolfenstein parameter lambda. S23 uh, this gets relabeled to lambda squared times A. So we have this hierarchy that S12 should be much smaller than 1, so this lambda should be much smaller than 1. S23 much smaller than uh, S12, so now we call that thing lambda squared and then them put in some fudge factor A to uh, compensate uh, for any differences uh, uh, that, are, that are not included when uh, we just write S23 as lambda squared. And then S13 times the face that we write as A times lambda cubed. And then we need a complex fudge factor that we call rho plus I eta. And at that point, it's just a relabeling of those, of those mixing angles. Um, and what one then usually does is one now uses this lambda as a expansion parameter and just uh, expands uh, this uh, CK matrix given the standard representation consistently to some order in lambda. But again, I want to re-emphasize that this Wolfenstein parameterization by itself is not an approximation. It's just a reparametrization in, in that way. And so if you uh, do now a consistent expansion in terms of lambda, you get the, the usual form that you've probably seen many times. Uh, the ZKM matrix in that case can be written as 1 minus lambda squared over 2. And we have a lambda here, a, a lambda cubed rho minus i eta minus lambda, a 1 minus lambda squared over 2. Uh, a lambda squared here, uh, a lambda cubed, and then one minus rho minus i eta here, minus a lambda squared, and uh, to a good approximation one for VTB, plus terms of order lambda to the four. Yes? Um, you could, you could, you could uh, write it in, in, in that way. Um, there's no real advantage, I, I guess, to put an A also, also here. I guess it's just a, yeah, I guess a choice you, you can make so to put this A which shows up, which is determined by this S23 also into the, into the S13.
Now there's a slightly different uh, set of parameters that is sometimes used uh, in terms of, uh, instead of rho and eta, uh, the parameters called rho bar and, and eta bar, and they are defined in the, in the following way. So rho bar plus i eta bar is defined as uh, minus vud vub conjugated over vcd vcb conjugated. And if you look at the um, uh, this lambda expansion of the CK matrix, uh, and at this definition of what rho bar and, and eta bar are, uh, you find that rho bar and eta bar are very close to rho and eta. Uh, they differ by terms of order lambda squared. So rho bar is the same as rho, up to small corrections. And the same for eta. Eta bar is approximately the same as eta up to small corrections. And often one actually uses rho bar and eta bar as the uh, actual parameters in the Wolfenstein parameterization uh, to, to write the CKM matrix. And the reason why one uses uh, rho bar and eta bar um, is that they show up in uh, what is called a, uh, in, in so-called CKM uh, unitarity triangles. You probably have seen uh, those uh, as well. So rho bar and eta bar show up in unitarity triangles, which are just the conditions uh, of unitarity of the CK matrix, uh, the uh, conditions that uh, if you multiply uh, rows uh, and uh, complex conjugate rows, you get, you get zeros. So there are, in principle, six of them. Uh, one where this rho bar and eta bar show up is, uh, is the following, a VUD times VUB star plus VCD, VCB star plus VTD, VTB star is zero. So these are three complex numbers adding up to zero. You can uh, draw that as a triangle in the, in the complex plane. And uh, it's convenient to normalize that uh, such that one of those uh, terms is one. So we can divide out VCD, uh, VCB star. Uh, let me do that in a quick way. And then this first term that corresponds exactly to the definition of, of rho bar and eta bar. And so this relation, this unitarity relation, uh, can then be drawn as a triangle in the rho bar eta bar plane, where we have this one. And, uh, and then uh, this term here, the VTD times VTB star over VCD VCB star, that will be some complex number. Uh, the length of that, of that side of the, of the triangle is, well, the absolute value of, of that. And the, the apex of this triangle, that is exactly uh, rho bar and, and eta bar. And then this, uh, this first term here, that brings us back to, to the origin, to zero. And the length of that side of the triangle 
is the absolute value of, uh, of, that, uh, of that combination of CKM matrix elements. Angles of this triangle, uh, they also have names. This angle here is called gamma, or also sometimes phi 3. This angle here is called beta, or sometimes also phi 1. And this angle up here, that is alpha, or phi 2. Yes. Oh, um, <laughs> I actually do not know. Um, so, so the alpha, beta, gamma convention that was used by the Babar experiment, uh, the, the phi 1, phi 2, phi 3 convention was mainly used by the Bell experiment. Um, why they choose this particular Labeling, I do not know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. One thing I feel like I've never quite understood is um, what's the phenomenological implication of having this complex phase that we're talking about? Oh, yeah. So this complex phase, that's a, a source of uh, CP violation. Uh, so uh, um, if you look at the Ancel Lagrangian, the, um, the charge current interactions of the W with the up quarks and the down quarks, uh, if there is this uh, CP rating phase in the CKM matrix, uh, then CP uh, is violated. If you perform a CP transformation on that, on that charge current deduction term, you see that you don't get the, the same back if, if there's a phase in the CKM matrix. So it's a source of, of CP violation, and uh, many, uh, it leads to many CP violating uh, phenomena in, uh, uh, in, the, in the flavor sector, uh, both for, for kaons and also for uh, uh, B mesons and also for, for D mesons. Uh, and many of those things have been observed. And in particular, uh, what the p violation uh, indicates in the context of this triangle is that this, uh, that is a, this is an actual triangle. It's not just a, a flat line where, where those uh, three terms would be just real numbers that you add up to zero, but it's a, actually uh, an actual triangle in that complex rho bar uh, eta bar plane. And these angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, they can be measured by measuring uh, CP asymmetries. So uh, asymmetries in uh, the case of, let's say, B mesons versus uh, anti-B mesons and things like that. So I, I don't want to go into uh, much details here. That's sort of a, in some sense, that's a, a classical topic of, of, of flavor lectures. Uh, but uh, uh, because we have limited time, I didn't want to spend too much time on sort of these classical uh, topics in, in flavor physics and focus more on uh, things like the flavor normally said that that's sort of the hot topic at the at the moment. Yeah, but just wanted to sort of uh, uh, um, follow up on on that. We we will very briefly talk about how these angles, alpha, beta, gamma, are measured, but in, in a very superficial way uh, in the in the coming few minutes. I just wanted to say that this rho bar eta bar plane is something that you have probably often seen uh, uh, diagrams or, or plots of this unitarity triangle with many different measurements of CKM parameters uh, shown in that particular plane. Uh, and then you see uh, to which extent they all consistently overlap and all uh, point to the same uh, apex. Uh, we have measurements of, of those sides of the CKM matrix, uh, uh, of those CKM matrix elements that determine the sides the length of the sides of this, of this, uh, of this triangle, uh, measurements of these angles. And one can check then if all these things are self-consistent and if the CKM picture of flavor violation in the standard model uh, is actually uh, realized, if that is a consistent picture of all the phenomena that we, that we observe. Yes, so just very, very briefly um, how uh, are those various entries of the CKM matrix measured? 
um, there is a VUD or the, the absolute value of VUD that is uh, the, the most precise measurement of that comes actually from uh, nuclear beta decay. Uh, we have transitioned from a, uh, uh, from a neutron to a, uh, to a proton. VUS that comes from semi-leptonic k on decays. So we have a transition from a strange quark to an up quark. So things like k2 pi l nu. There are uh, measurements of the ratio of, of VUS over VUD. That can be done, for example, by comparing uh, decays of kaons with decays of pions. So in particular, leptonic decays of, of kaons, um, k2 mu nu over pi2 mu nu. That gives a, a very precise determination of the ratio of VUS over VUD. If you go to CK matrix elements that involves the charm, things like a VCD or VCS, there you can look at semi-leptonic decays of D mesons. So things like D2 pi L nu or D2 K L nu. Similarly for uh, CK matrix elements that involve the, the B quark, VUB or VCB, there you look at semi-leptonic decays of, of B mesons, B2 D L nu or B2 pi L nu. What is also uh, done in the case of VUB and VCB um, is to look at so-called inclusive decay. So, so this decays B2 D L nu, B2 pi L nu, that would be called exclusive decay. So have a well-defined uh, uh, hadronic final state, uh, a D meson or, or a pion in, in, in those examples. Uh, but you can also look at those decays in an inclusive way, where you say the, the B meson decays into anything, any hadronic state that contains a charm or in any hadronic state that contains an, an up quark. Those would be inclusive B2 X C L nu or B2 X U L nu. And there are actually uh, tensions uh, in some of these cases, uh, if you use these inclusive decays to determine what VUB and VCB are, or if you use the exclusive decays, you get uh, slightly different uh, values. Uh, the tensions are at the two to three sigma level, and sort of that's one area where there's quite a bit of work being dedicated to trying to sort out what's happening there. Uh, so there we have these different types of determinations of VUB and VCB, and they don't match up very uh, exactly, and uh, it's not fully understood where these discrepancies come from. So there might be some systematic uncertainties in either of these two types of determinations that are not f fully understood, which might be uh, leading to different values for VUB and, and VCB. Um, If you look at, at the other elements, what we have still left is VTB that you can try to get from, uh, from top decays, top decaying into a B and, and W, or also from single top production. If you um, assume unitarity of the CKM matrix, well, you're, you're measuring essentially one. Um, so uh, uh, under the assumption of, of, of unitarity, uh, these measurements, they, they don't provide uh, a lot of non-trivial input into measurements of CKM matrix parameters. Yes? Um, how can you get a measurement on VTB via single top production? Yes, OK, you have to look. Uh, um, how you get single top production at, at colliders. 
Uh, and the way to, uh, to do that is, well, it, it goes through the, uh, the weak interactions. You produce a, uh, a top quark in association with a, with a B quark. Uh, the one possible diagram uh, would be the following. You start out with a, uh, an up-down initial state, a W boson, and uh, let's say a top quark and, a, and an anti-B quark. That would be one uh, diagram uh, that would contribute to single top production. And then this, this vertex here is proportional to, to VTB. And so by measuring that cross-section, you have sensitivity to the CK matrix element. Yeah. Yes, I have a question about usually, I mean, it's, su it's surprising to me that we extracted from like nuclear beta decay and not like from like first and free rise and the other species, except from mesent physics. So I would expect that like, I don't know, pi and beta decay, we know pi is better than nucleus, so why do we expect yes. some, some interaction? Yes, so in principle, you can uh, use pi on beta decay, so pi plus decaying into pi zero L nu. Uh, that in principle exists, so the problem is, uh, so this is a very, very rare decay because you have almost no phase space for that, for that decay to happen. Uh, so the, uh, the measurement of, of, of pi on decay, of that uh, pi on beta decay, has, a, has a, still a sizable uncertainty. So actually, there are experiments uh, proposed that, uh, uh, that uh, to propose to improve that, that precision and that to give a competitive determination of, of VUD that is competitive in precision with, with the nuclear beta decay. Uh, determinations. That's a so-called pioneer experiment that is proposed at, at PSI in, in Switzerland. But yeah, so this uh, uh, VUD determination, yeah, you have to know some nuclear physics in order to, to make this extraction. Um, I don't understand nuclear physics well enough to, to say how uh, well uh, theoretical uncertainties are under control in, in those cases. Uh, in, in fact, if you, if you take the uh, uh, the existing measurements of, of VUD and, and VUS at, at face value, there is some tension with unitarity. Um, so um, if you look at, uh, again, the CK matrix here, um, VUB is very small. So if you uh, want to check unitarity, that has almost no impact. There's negligible impact at the current position. So you want to check that uh, VUD squared plus uh, VUS squared add up to one. And they don't quite add up to one with the quoted uncertainties. And uh, um, I guess most particle physicists say that, OK, maybe we don't understand nuclear physics well enough to get to the precision that is, that is claimed for VUD. Um, or maybe there's some crazy new physics that, that would lead to that. But uh, it's uh, um, explanations of, of why there shouldn't be unitarity in, the, uh, in this uh, first row of the CK matrix are, are Pretty stretched, I, I would say. Yes? So if they don't have to one, can you say there's a fourth generation? Uh, and then maybe that this the missing piece? Also, that is uh, difficult to, uh, to reconcile with other constraints uh, that we have. In, in, in principle, yes. Uh, uh, you could say that there might be some, um, maybe the ZK matrix is a, is a four times four matrix, or maybe there's something that, that mixes into it. Maybe it's a a three times four matrix or, or, or something like that. Uh, that entry has to be fairly large. Uh, it has to be larger than, than VUB to have, to have an impact. Uh, and that would likely show up in all kinds of other flavor transitions as well. It would modify uh, meson mixing uh, predictions, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, so it's difficult to reconcile that with other experimental uh, uh, constraints. More likely, you would add, if you want to do that, you would probably add some four Fermi contact interaction, which modifies uh, either nuclear beta decay or, or those uh, K-on decays. It just changes the rate. So it's not, dominant, it's not uh, purely determined by the CK matrix, but there's some additional source of flavor violation that leads to those decays. So what you actually measure in those decays is not the CK matrix, but CK matrix plus some new physics correction. And that would explain why CK matrix seems non-unitarity non-unitary if it's determined in, in that way. OK. Um, and then uh, the last two entries, that would be VTS and VTD. Um, you could try to measure them in, also in top decay. The so top, in principle, 
has some branching ratio into, into strange W and down W, but the branching ratios are, are tiny. So we know that VTS and, and VTD are very small. So the branching ratios at the top into strange and down final states are very small, and you would need to distinguish those strange chats and down chats from uh, B chats, which are two or three orders of magnitude more, more frequent. So that's very, very difficult. So the, the best way to get to VTS and to VTD is through loop processes, where you have the top quark inside a loop. For example, these uh, meson mixing uh, amplitudes we had looked at uh, previously, where you, inside the loop, you have a, have a top quark and a W boson. So meson mixing uh, oscillation frequencies, B meson mixing oscillation frequencies, they are uh, proportional to those CKM matrix elements. And you can use the measurements of, of B meson mixing to determine what VTS and VTD are. And then, just very briefly, these angles alpha, beta, and gamma, so that before they uh, can be measured through CP asymmetries. So beta, that's a very famous measurement. So that's the time-dependent CP asymmetry. In decays of neutral B mesons to shape psi k short, which is the CP symmetry is proportional to the sinus of two times beta. And uh, the B factories, Babar and Bell, they were essentially designed to, to measure this CP symmetry and to measure this angle beta. And uh, you can do something similar uh, for the angle alpha. There you look at, at time dependent CP symmetries in the case of, of B mesons to either pi pi or rho rho or pi rho. And uh, the angle gamma that you get from uh, CP asymmetries in uh, B meson decays to D mesons and, and k ons. That is sort of the main way to determine gamma. And uh, you can convince yourself that this makes sense if you, if you uh, uh, look here at, again at the CKM uh, unitarity triangle. If you see which CKM matrix elements enter uh, into this triangle, you can figure out uh, which, uh, uh, to which faces uh, of CKM matrix elements these angles alpha, beta, and gamma correspond to, and then you know which types of the case you need to look at to be sensitive to the corresponding CKM matrix elements. Yeah. Um, yes, good. Um, so the, the B mesons, they, they oscillate. We have BB bar oscillations, uh, which is a time dependent uh, phenomenon. And though these time dependent CP asymmetries are essentially, uh, uh, you, what you compare is uh, the decay rate of a B meson into J psi K short and of a B bar meson into J psi K short. And you do that in a, in a time de dependent way. So you resolve the, uh, the oscillations of the, of the B mesons. And in that way, you get this time dependent uh, CP asymmetry, which oscillates with the uh, oscillation frequency of the B mesons. And the amplitude of this oscillation is proportional to the sinus of, of two times this angle beta. And then there are, uh, with all these measurements, with all these determinations of CKM matrix elements, there are two strategies that one can uh, follow. Uh, the first one would be, you would take all the information that we have, uh, combine them into a global fit, and extract uh, these Wolfenstein parameters, lambda, A, rho bar, and eta bar, uh, in, yeah, in a global standard model uh, CKM fit. And there are a couple of groups uh, who, who do these types of fits, uh, the CKM fit group and the UT fit group, and you probably have seen um, plots of the unitarity triangle of those groups, which show the various constraints uh, imposed on the rho bar, eta bar plane. Um, then one can check in this context if the fit is a, is a good fit. So what is the goodness of the fit? And overall, those fits, uh, uh, they work pretty well. There's a pretty good consistency among all these various measurements. Um, one has many more measurements than the four parameters, so this is a highly over-constrained 
uh, fit that one, is, that one is doing. The other approach, the alternative approach, uh, would be to uh, use a minimal set of input parameters to, de to determine the CK matrix elements, and then make standard model predictions for all the other uh, observables that one can measure, and then compare if the measurements agree with those standard model predictions. And that's a, a, what one then usually does is one focuses on, uh, on measurements to determine the ZK matrix elements where one believes that they are not very sensitive to new physics effects. So one focuses on, on tree-level processes where one has a tree-level W uh, exchange uh, where new physics would need to um, compete with this tree-level W exchange. It would need to be fairly light and a fairly large coupling, so most likely that would have shown up uh, somewhere else already. So one can focus on a few uh, measurements where one can be fairly confident that there shouldn't be large new physics contamination, use those measurements to determine what the CKM parameters are, and then use uh, those uh, determinations to make predictions for in particular loop level processes, which potentially are sensitive to new physics, and then compare those uh, predictions with, with measurements. Uh, basic uh, setup uh, that one uses. Questions about, about this part? Okay, then uh, let me switch a bit gears uh, and let's go to the next topic that is about uh, explaining uh, hierarchies in the standard model uh, Yukawa couplings. And in the notes, that's chapter four, the standard model flavor puzzle. And uh, the standard model flavor puzzle, well, that's, that's a, sort of the name that one gives to this uh, question of the origin of the hierarchies in the, uh, the Yukawa couplings or the standard model flavor parameters. Um, there is, uh, beyond the question of, of the origins, there is a, a zeros order question. Uh, why are there three generations? I don't have an answer for that question. If any one of you has, please let me know. Um, it's uh, yeah. I don't know of any good of any good uh, answer to to this question. And then sort of the the follow up questions are about the hierarchies. Why are there hierarchical masses of fermions? And uh, why hierarchical CKM mixing angles? And uh, if one tries to address this question about the hierarchical masses and, and mixing angles, one has to make uh, some assumptions about the, about the starting point. Um, so one can either assume that uh, electric symmetry breaking happens as in the standard model. That this is one Higgs doublet, which gives mass to, uh, to all the uh, fermions. Yes, it's a question. Um, is the idea with the second question that the most natural thing would be for all the fermion masses to be degenerate, or just same order of magnitude? Not that you wouldn't expect them to be degenerate unless you have some symmetry reason of why they should be all the same. Uh, but you would expect generically that they all that they are all of the same order. That these Yukawa couplings are, if they are generic three times three matrices, you just write on a random uh, three times three uh, three matrix. Uh, the eigenvalues of that matrix wouldn't be very hierarchical. They would be all roughly of the same order. Uh, and the other couplings that we know in the standard model, the, the gauge couplings, they are roughly of, of order one, or at least not very small. Um, so naively, you might expect that your cover couplings should have uh, a similar order. So all of the masses should be uh, coming from order one your cover couplings, so all the quarks and leptons should be around the electric weak scale. But they are not. Many of them are much, much lighter. So the question is, why are some of the eigenvalues of these Yukawa matrices is uh, much, much smaller than one. 
And, uh, and yeah, so that, uh, th that picture that uh, all these hierarchies should actually come from hierarchies in Yukawa couplings, that holds uh, if you have electric symmetry breaking S in the standard model. If there's one Higgs, uh, which gives mass to all the uh, fermions, uh, then you need to have hierarchies in the Yukawa couplings to explain the hierarchies of the fermion masses. So if electric symmetry breaking S in the standard model, then these hierarchies come from hierarchical Yukawas. And then you need, or you would like to come up with some mechanism that gives you hierarchical Yukawas. Um, on the other hand, you, you could try to sort of modify how electric symmetry breaking works. Uh, for example, you, you could uh, have a scenario where you have more than one source of electric symmetry breaking. Maybe the, the heaviest uh, 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 fermions and the massive gauge bosons, maybe they get their, vacuum, uh, their, their masses from the vacuum excitation value of the, uh, of the Higgs that we have discovered, which is largely standard model-like. But maybe there's an additional subdominant source of electric symmetry breaking, and the light fermions, they get their mass from, from that subdominant source of electric symmetry breaking. That might be sort of an alternative route that you, that you might want to take. Um, so, uh, so we have an extended electric symmetry breaking sector. And then part of the hierarchies and the masses of the fermions might come uh, from the fact that you have more than one source of electric symmetry breaking, and some of these sources might be small. Also, the hierarchies might be partly due to some subdominant source of electric symmetry breaking. Simplest example would be that you have a two Higgs doublet model. You don't have one Higgs, but you have two of them. Oh, question, yep. Um, from the low energy point of view, if you just uh, know about the masses of the, of the fermions, you wouldn't be able to distinguish that. Uh, but uh, the, the idea would be that you uh, uh, might be able to test that physics that leads to these hierarchies in, in some way. Uh, and in that way, you might be able to distinguish those, those two options. Okay. But in terms of the low energy, it'll still be identical. If, if you go to, uh, to the very low energies and you, and you don't know exactly where, uh, how electric symmetry breaking works, you don't know what the physics is that might imprint hierarchical Yukawa couplings. No, you, you couldn't distinguish them. Um, so the simplest example of this second option would be a two Higgs doublet setup uh, where you have one Higgs, um, uh, which has a large vacuum expectation value, a second Higgs, which is a somewhat smaller vacuum expectation value, uh, and they couple to different uh, fermions, and in that way, uh, you get some hierarchy for fermion masses based on the hierarchy of vacuum expectation values. Um, this happens to some extent in the minimal supersymmetric extension of the standard model. Uh, in the MSSM, you have two Higgs doublets, uh, and there is the so-called large tangent beta regime of the MSSM. Uh, the tangent beta is the ratio of the two vacuum expectation value of these two Higgs uh, doublets. Uh, if tangent beta is large, that means that the Higgs that couples to the uptype quarks has a much larger vacuum expectation value than the Higgs that couples to the downtype quarks and the leptons. Uh, and in that setup, you could explain the uh, hierarchy between the mass of the top quark uh, on the one hand and then the, the bottom quark and the tau uh, on the other hand by this large value of, of tangent beta, by this large hierarchy between vacuum expectation values. Another idea uh, that I had, have been working on 
in recent years uh, to some extent is uh, that you have uh, two Higgs doublets. One doublet couples to the third generation, dominant to the third generation. Uh, the second Higgs couples to first and second generation. And that way you can try to uh, partly explain why the third generation is much heavier than the first and second generation uh, if you assume that there is some hierarchy in vacuum expectation values. The problem with those models is that yeah, you only partly explain hierarchies. Uh, you, you could go to an extreme case where you uh, have sort of a, a private Higgs for each fermion and then have vacuum expectation values that are very hierarchical and reproduce the fermion masses. But you don't really gain anything because now you just have shuffled hierarchies in your cover couplings into hierarchies of vacuum expectation values. And arguably, hierarchies in vacuum expectation values are even more complicated to explain than hierarchies in, in your cover couplings. Um, so in the end, in any case, you want to have some mechanism that does produce hierarchies in your cover couplings, either to fully explain uh, the hierarchical structure of the masses and TKM mixing angles, or uh, at least uh, largely explain them, uh, even if some of the hierarchies might be explained in another way. OK. Um, so let me give you a, a few uh, examples of uh, mechanisms or, or models uh, that uh, people came up with that can lead to hierarchical Yukawa couplings. So the, uh, the most famous example uh, is based on spontaneously broken flavor symmetries. And the simplest example uh, in that class uh, of, of models uh, would be models where you have a U1 flavor symmetry. Uh, usually goes under the name of Frogat Nielsen uh, flavor symmetries or Frogat Nielsen models. And we, I want to discuss those in a, uh, in a bit more detail. Uh, after I've done this list of a few options. So we'll come back to that. Um, the second uh, type of scenarios are extra dimensional models where you have some exponentially small wave function overlap of different uh, generations of, of fermion fields. And I believe uh, last week, Raman has had talked about that to, to some extent uh, in, in RS models. Uh, we have this warped uh, geometry. Uh, if the Higgs is localized on the, uh, on the IR brain, and then you can have uh, uh, the various generations of, of quarks and leptons be localized uh, either towards the UV brain or towards the IR brain. And depending on how they are exactly uh, localized, you can get exponential hierarchies in, in their masses based on this wave function overlap with the Higgs boson. There's the idea of radiative flavor. There you start out with a scenario where at tree level you only have a uh, coupling of the of the Higgs to the to the heaviest uh, uh, to the heaviest fermions, and then couplings to lighter fermions are generated at the at the loop level. You probably still want to use some type of 
for symmetry to start out with this uh, structure that at the beginning you only have coupling to, let's say, the third generation or coupling maybe only to the top, um, and then have uh, uh, some amount of breaking of those flavor symmetries which show up at the loop level uh, that, such that you get small Yukawa couplings for light fermions uh, that are loop suppressed. Yeah? It's surprising to me that that one hasn't been ruled out by experiment. Okay. Um, all those scenarios, uh, in principle, uh, are not necessarily testable, actually. Um, what those models need to accomplish is to generate hierarchies in Yukawa couplings. Yukawa couplings are dimensionless couplings. They don't have any scale attached to them. So whatever physics is there that, that leaves this imprint on the Yukawa couplings can, in principle, will be arbitrarily heavy. So it's, it's not guaranteed that any of those models leave observable consequences at, at low energies. Uh, so you can, in all those cases, you can in principle uh, decouple the new physics and you can still uh, retain hierarchical Yukawa couplings that can come from all of those mechanisms. It's only if uh, these models, for some reason, are anchored at some low scale uh, that you, that you uh, can potentially test them. Yes? Yes. Yes. Right. Uh, also, you, you you can't rule out those as well, uh, and it's basically the same the same reason as uh, as. Uh, for the models that try to address everything in terms of you cover hierarchies. Uh, two exhibit models have uh, uh, in them the so-called decoupling limit. Uh, so if you, if you take uh, this two exhibit model uh, and you, uh, you make the second doublet heavier and heavier, you recover uh, the standard model. Uh, so all the couplings of the, of the light Higgs, the physical light Higgs that, that, that remains in the spectrum, those couplings all become uh, exactly standard model-like if you completely decouple the, the second Higgs. Uh, so no matter how you start out coupling this, uh, uh, this second Higgs uh, uh, at the beginning, no matter how crazy you cover couplings uh, you have, no matter how crazy flavor structure you have, uh, if you make the second doublet heavy, uh, in that limit, the, the light Higgs remains standard model-like. To the extent, uh, yes, that you just assume that the second, that the original setup is such that you have uh, this uh, uh, sort of uh, separation of, of generations to, to some extent. Yes, that, that does work. Yeah. And if you change the mass of the second doublet, you need to keep the left Higgs of the second Higgs. So, like, I mean, is there a problem with the board? There is some amount of, of, of fine tuning that, that, is, uh, that is happening in, in those cases. Uh, so that has to do with uh, yeah, the, the problem that uh, you're explaining part of the hierarchies through hierarchies of vacuum expectation values. And uh, uh, if you have the second doublet very heavy, you wouldn't necessarily ex expect that the, the vacuum expectation value of, of, of that, that one is, is very small. There would be some, something that you need to fine tune in your potential to, to make this work. Um, okay, and then uh, another thing that I wanted to mention briefly are so-called clockwork models. Um, this is an idea where for each, uh, so in the context of flavor, that would correspond to a scenario where uh, to each uh, standard model fermion you, you introduce uh, a chain of, of additional fermions which are yeah, chained together by uh, uh, by mass terms uh, in such a way that you get a, a mass matrix which has one zero eigenvalue. Uh, this uh, the mass eigenstate that corresponds to that zero mode you would interpret as, as the standard model uh, state. And the standard model state would have, an, again, an exponentially small uh, overlap with one end of that chain of, of fermions. And if the Higgs couples to that end of, of chain of, of fermions, you would get exponentially suppressed uh, Yukawa couplings in, in that way. So in some sense, it's similar to this, uh, to this extra-dimensional models, and sometimes it's also similar 
to this uh, U1 Froggart Nielsen models. But instead of one U1, you have now many U1s which chain together this uh, string of, of, of fermions. Um, so this is just uh, a list of, of examples of what types of models are, are out there that try to address hierarchical Yukawa couplings. And let me spend how many, 10, last 10 minutes or so, uh, with going in a bit more details into these Frogart Nielsen type of models and, and how they actually work. And I want to discuss a, a toy example where we will try to explain why there might be a hierarchy between the mass of the up quark and the mass of the, of the top quark. Um, and the basic idea is we will assign uh, the standard model fermions a charge and a, a new flavor symmetry. So let's say the, the charge of the left handed top quark is zero, the charge of the right handed top quark is also zero, but the charge of the left handed up quark is three, and the charge of the right handed up quark is minus three. And with those charge assignments of the fermions, I'm allowed to write down uh, a Yukawa coupling for the, for the top. With the usual thing, a uh, uh, Yukawa coupling, top left, top right, and the Higgs. That's perfectly compatible with, with those charge assignments. The top is uncharged. Uh, that's as in the, in the standard model. But I wouldn't be allowed to write down a Yukawa coupling for the, for the up quark because uh, the charges don't, don't work out. Uh, so in order to, to couple the Higgs to the up quarks, uh, I need to introduce some additional field which can compensate for these charges that the, that the up quarks have. And I want to make the following choice. Uh, so if I, if I look at the up quark, I will introduce a, a scalar field phi. Uh, which has charge plus one. So it's the scalar field. is often called a Flavon field. And then I can write a Yukawa coupling for the up quark uh, in terms of a higher dimensional operator, which will include this Flavon field. Uh, let me move over here. So now I can write a uh, coupling that I call yu tilde. And then I need six powers of that, of that Flavon field. Uh, and to get the mass dimension right, I need some scale lambda to the sixth power. And then u left, u right, times c, the Higgs. Next, I will assume that this scalar field acquires a vacuum expectation value uh, and spontaneously breaks uh, the flavor symmetry.
and that then produces a Yukawa coupling of the, of the up quark, which is given by this uh, U tilde coupling times the vacuum expectation value of that scalar field divided by this new physics scale lambda to the sixth power. And as long as this vacuum expectation value is somewhat smaller than this scale lambda, I can engineer an exponential suppression of that proto Yukawa coupling via tilde and get something uh, that is very, very small. So that via tilde would be some order of one proto Yukawa coupling, which gets scaled down by some high power of some smallish uh, parameter. Yes? Exactly. So that uh, is something you, you can work out as an exercise in principle now. You just have to uh, make charge assignments for all the uh, different types of, of fermions such that you get, uh, uh, such you can reproduce uh, the hierarchical spectrum of, of, of masses that, that we observe. Uh, um, well, so let's say if you, if you want to explain now the, the mass of the charm quark, uh, what I would do is I would uh, assign the charm quark uh, a charge that is not as large as the one for the up quark. Maybe I want to give the, the, the charm quark as a charge of one or, or two. And in that case, I will get uh, the charm Yukawa coupling now is some order one charm proto Yukawa coupling, and now this ratio of phi over lambda to some smaller power, maybe two or three or four or something like that. And so, yeah, what you want to do is you want to uh, assign then for all the standard model fermions appropriate charges such that you get uh, the spectrum that, that is observed. Yes? Yes. Um, those operators, they, they don't need to show up at, at Google level. They, they can, this can be tree level. Um, so the sort of the simplest UV completion of, of, of that operator would be a, a scenario where you have the Higgs coupling to some uh, heavy fermion. Uh, and then you have some, this field phi, which couples to that fermion, and then you have some some other fermion, and then yet some other fermion, and you have some chain of, of fermions. And somewhere at the end, let's say you have the left-handed up, and somewhere here at the end of that chain, you have the, the right-handed up. That would be the, the simplest way to, to get this type of structure. In the case of radiative, uh, mass generation, yeah, you, you do have actual loops that, that generate uh, those couplings of the X to the light generations. Um, so the, the other thing, in addition to explaining the, uh, the hierarchies of masses, you also want to explain the hierarchies of the, of the CKM matrix. Uh, so that's something on top of, uh, of explaining the uh, the mass hierarchies. Uh, and uh, in that context, it, it's typically convenient uh, to make a choice of what that ratio of the vacuum expectation value of the flavon field over that, that scale is. And uh, the typical choice uh, that, that people make is that this uh, phi over lambda is approximately the Wolfenstein parameter lambda that's sort of a, uh, that makes life typically easy. In that way, you get a very definite answer for some of the uh, differences of charges of, of left-handed quark fields in order to reproduce the, uh, the scaling of the entries of the, of the CKM matrix in, in terms of lambda. And then the other charges, the charges of the right-handed uh, quark fields, those would then be determined by the ratios of, of the masses of the, of the quark fields. And you can do something similar in the, in the lepton sector as well. And yeah, so that uh, uh, brings us, I guess, to the end of, of today. Any, any more questions about, about this? Yes? Uh, so why would you do it to the sixth power? That seems very random. Yes, so the way I've 
Yes, the way I have introduced it is, is very random. I just wanted to give some example of some suppression factor. Uh, if you choose uh, this ratio to be roughly lambda, uh, I think 6 might get you roughly to the ratio of, of up quark mass to top quark mass, maybe not quite. Uh, if, if you put in the numbers, this might be, it needs to be maybe 7, maybe 8, maybe 5, depending on what you assume that this ratio is. Uh, you want a, sort of a large enough number that you can explain all the ratios of, of quark masses to some approximation. Uh, yeah, but, but 6 was just some random example. Yes? Um, oh, um, so that anomaly cancellation, that, that uh, comes into play if you really consider this U1 as a symmetry that you want to gauge. Um, so if you want to, to gauge uh, that flavor symmetry and maybe you want to gauge it, then, then you have to be careful about charge assignments and uh, make sure that you have uh, anomaly cancellation and uh, then uh, um, probably these additional fields, uh, they, they will play a role. Uh, what, what are the charges of those additional fields that, 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 that show up in the, in the model, et cetera. If you, if you don't gauge the, uh, the U1, then you, because of the spontaneous symmetry breaking, you will be left with a, with a Goldstone boson. Uh, and this Goldstone boson typically will have large flavor changing couplings and you, you have very strong constraints on the existence of such Goldstone bosons with flavor changing couplings. The most strong, the most stringent constraints comes from decays of kaons, k to pi, and then this Goldstone boson A. Uh, so that typically tells you that the scale in the simplest models, the scales, they need to be very, very high, something like 10 to the 12 GV or something like that. Otherwise, uh, you would have seen this process happening. Okay, uh, I guess uh, that's it for today. Thanks.